Just as terrorist attacks threaten our communities, extreme weather disrupts the security of our nation. Extreme weather strains our resources, diverts attention from counterterrorism efforts, serves as a threat multiplier that aggravates stressors both at home and abroad, and destabilizes the lifeline sectors on which we rely. For a long time now, legends of technology capable of affecting our climate have been discussed. Most are, of course, false, so far as we knew. We believed that humanity was not yet technologically advanced enough to create natural disasters. But what if we were wrong? What if I told you that not only does the government have the technology to modify the climate, but has already used it in battle? The difference between this story and an urban legend is that this has been officially confirmed and declassified. Today, we're going to take a look at Operation Popeye. If you want to talk about controlling the weather as something that can only happen in the far future, well then you will be shocked to know that this secret operation occurred in the 1960s. The country responsible for modifying the Earth's climate for military purpose was the United States. The objective was to weaken the Viet Cong. But how exactly did they change the weather? According to various reports, lead and silver iodide was deployed by aircraft and was used in an attempt to increase cloud seeding and increase rainfall, weakening the Viet Cong. They wanted to oversaturate the grounds where the enemy forces would pass, causing ground displacement, making it difficult to mobilize. The mission's motto was make mud, not war. They were trying to defeat the enemy with mud instead of weapons. Two F-3 Phantom aircrafts and a C-130 Hercules were used for the cloud seeding process. Now, they weren't making rain appear per se. The process was simply to lengthen the existing rainfalls. The Viet Cong never suspected that the U.S. was changing the weather. The operation lasted from March 20th, 1967 to July 5th, 1972. Operation Popeye was first revealed to the public in March of 1971 thanks to reporter Jack Anderson. He published several classified documents of the operation. Then in 1972, it was shown to the American public on a large scale through the New York Times publication. This caused an outrage. The American people could not believe that the U.S. government would use the weather as a weapon. This caused the cessation of the project. Thereafter, the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate voted in favor of the ban of environmental warfare. To this day, the strategy of modifying the climate to obtain a military advantage is officially prohibited in the country. But was the operation successful? The fact that the project lasted so long could be a sign that it did work, and that it actually increased the amount of rain. Maybe it was achieving its goal against the enemy army. However, the U.S. Army did lose the war against Vietnam, so maybe it wasn't as effective. The point here is, if we could already modify the Earth's climate over 50 years ago, Imagine what could be achieved with today's technology. Eating. Indeed, the UK saw a low temperature of minus 9.4 degrees Celsius last week at Tullock Bridge in the Highlands, the coldest ever recorded for that date in books going back to the 1800s. But even before that record cold snap, with a mean central England temperature of 5.7 degrees Celsius to April 11th, England was on for its 16th coldest April since records began 362 years ago back in 1659, and its chilliest since 1922. Not to be outdone, many areas in Slovenia also reached their coldest April morning over the last 100 years last week. The official meteorological station Nova Vasno Bloka peaked at minus 20.6 degrees Celsius, which has set a new all-time national record for Slovenia's coldest April temperature in history. This pips the previous record of minus 20.4 degrees set in 1956, which occurred, and this will come as no surprise to regular viewers of this segment, during a period of low sunspot activity, such as we are experiencing now. In Israel, too, last week, we saw surprising below-average temperatures right across the country, turning Mount Hermon into a winter wonderland. Even Alaska is having record cold spells at the moment, and that's saying something. Fairbanks dropped to a staggering 27 degrees below zero, smashing the century-old record of 16 below zero set in 1911. Now, remember back in February, I reported on the horrendous cold weather in Texas, where blackouts, partly caused by frozen windmills, led to the tragic deaths of people who were simply trying to stay warm. So I was intrigued by these observations by renowned climate skeptic Tony Heller from realclimatescience.com. Loveys, cover your ears and block your eyes, or the other way around. Have a listen. At the end of January, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Prediction Center predicted a warm February for the United States. That forecast didn't do too well, and we ended up having the coldest February in more than 30 years. Lots of people froze to death in Texas in the record cold. The Climate Prediction Center predicted hot temperatures in Texas, where temperatures can reach 90 or even 100 degrees during February. When NOAA's forecast failed, they tried to blame it on global warming. They said that global warming had disrupted the polar vortex. And they used this diagram to explain how global warming had caused a wavy jet stream. Note that this diagram is almost identical to the diagram used by Science News in 1975 to explain global cooling in the coming ice age. So apparently the symptoms of the global warming apocalypse and the global cooling apocalypse are... Nicely observed. And yes, lovies, I think Tony might be what you call a climate denier. So, record cold in the Northern Hemisphere and record cold in the Southern Hemisphere. 
Must be global warming. The cold invaded Tasmania, Victoria and South Australia last week, bringing freezing conditions on Sunday with low-level snow and the first frosts of the year. Even Tamworth had the coldest April day since 1876. And the Twitter account of Snow Forecast was excitedly boasting about snow in Australia two months before the start of the 2021 ski season. Even the Bureau of Meteorology couldn't deny what they called an Antarctic blast of the freezing conditions and premature cold weather, with senior VOM forecaster Jackson Brown telling the Daily Mail that temperatures are four to eight degrees Celsius below average. Jackson Brown. Bloomfield, Michigan, 1942. As World War II rages across several continents, acclaimed architect and eventual designer of the St. Louis Arch, Aero Saarinen, is secretly enlisted by the United States military to work for a new clandestine organization. Its name? The OSS, Office of Strategic Services, or as it is known today, the CIA. The fact that Aero Saarinen was in the OSS designing weapon systems during World War II, and at a time when the OSS was looking into ways to weaponize weather, makes his whole connection to the design of the St. Louis Arch extremely interesting. Now, that isn't to say I believe it can control the weather, but it does open the door to the idea that it might have been one of the things Saarinen was out to achieve. While at the OSS, Saarinen designed buildings and weapon systems, many of which were never completed or built. Is it possible he later used these secret plans to engineer the St. Louis Arch, creating something that can actually control or perhaps harness the weather? Controlling the weather is the ultimate superweapon. It's even more powerful than the atomic bomb. So if Eero Saarinen was involved in analyzing and studying the possibility of weather modification, and you put all those factors together, and I think you have a guy that basically conducted a big, giant weather modification experiment with the St. Louis Arch. Weather as a weapon? There are some who think the idea is not as preposterous as it seems. Especially when considering that, even today, many world governments are pouring millions of dollars into research designed to manipulate weather. I think weather modification has definitely been an ongoing endeavor of governments all over the world for decades. St. Louis Arch appears to be an experiment in weather modification. The harp device appears to be an experiment in weather modification. Who knows what the Russians or the Chinese are doing? There's some sort of technology out there. There's been lots of work in the field of weather control. Using silver iodide inside of thunderstorms to decrease the size of hail. That goes on in many parts of the world to alleviate that problem. They're always firing rockets into the atmosphere in China to manipulate the weather. But is this a good idea? You wonder if you could steer a tornado. What would it take? Even a nuclear weapon might just nudge it, if even that. One challenge with that is your shockwave is going to be hard to focus, perhaps, and it might cause the damage you were hoping to avoid with the tornado. I would be looking at how much can I control or change local pressures in the atmosphere near and around the tornado. These are forces at work that could wipe out major cities. And we're finding out every day new things that we've never seen before. So maybe the lesson learned here is we shouldn't meddle with forces that we don't really understand. Because we may not like the result. Weather. At its best, it can cleanse and renew. But at its most extreme, it can destroy everything in its path. No matter how much time and money we spend trying to control it and predict it, it remains as many things in our world among the unexplained. The hurricane is predicted to take. These artificial clouds will block the sun from evaporating more water to feed the hurricane. The reports coming into the control center indicate that the diversionary cloud seeding over Kansas is now creating a flood danger. Specially equipped robot aircraft are dispatched immediately to release a high concentration of cloud seeding material into the fringes of the storm. Heavier seeding from the ground also helps to subdue the rain by spreading it over a wider area. The controller calls for another view of the hurricane, which has now moved closer to the coast.
So here's what's left over my snow. I've got a little snow pile that I pushed up with the plow. And we've got this stuff that was left over. Snow pile. <laughs> I thought they were crazy at first, too. So here's what's left over my snow. We got a little snow pile that I pushed up with the plow. And then we got this stuff that was left over. Snow pile. So, anybody know what that is? Anyone know about harp? Does anyone know about weather modification? Does anyone know why we had such extreme cold and blizzards in Texas and Oklahoma and places that have never seen this kind of thing? Just asking for a friend. <laughs> I thought they were crazy at first too. We are in Houston, Texas, folks. This don't happen. This don't happen. I'm gonna make me a snow man. This ain't natural. This ain't natural. How is this still sitting up here? This is not regular. My hand is not, it's not wet. Look how dry. I mean, damn near ashy. Look how dry. Not a drop of water. Look at my hand. <laughs> This is not natural. I made this on Tuesday. Today is Thursday. That is, this is not natural. This is not natural. <laughs> what the hell? Good, that's plastic or something. The next day. visited HARP. I didn't even know what it was. I went to HARP as part of a physics club, the Society of, of Physics Students. I was a student here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and uh, HARP at the time held an annual open house event where the public could tour the facility and talk to the scientists. HARP is a facility to study the ionosphere, region 60 miles out, out into space. And that's a region where there's not much density. The, the air is very thin, mostly plasma, which means electrons and ions. When I saw this facility and saw how unique and interesting it was is when I decided to do my PhD thesis research uh, using the HARP facility itself. HARP stands for the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. The federal government spent about 300 million. It's the most exquisite of its kind in the world. It's currently owned and operated by the Air Force Research Lab. And they have other priorities. They've done some tests over the years. Now they want to go do other things. Just as terrorist attacks threaten our communities, extreme weather disrupts the security of our nation. Extreme weather strains our resources, 
diverts attention from counterterrorism efforts, serves as a threat multiplier that aggravates stressors both at home and abroad, and destabilizes the lifeline.